Well, we're carrying on in our studies in Isaiah. We're hearing what the Lord said to them oh, over two and a half thousand years ago. But at the same time, we're seeing how he is revealing who he is to us and what it means to come near and take refuge in the God of the Bible. The one who is powerful, the one who is present, the one who is our God. So with that in mind, please would you join me as we pray. Let's bow our heads together. Lord, we bow before you today because, in some sense, we want to posture our heart to receive from you. We want to thank you that you love to speak to, encourage, even challenge your people in your word. And we realize there is nothing worse than to have a hard heart and blocked ears that doesn't want to hear. We praise you that words from you can just change us in a moment. And so I dare to pray, Lord, that as I speak and unpack this, you would show us wonderful things about who you are that change us, that sustain us, that encourage us, comfort us. Lord, we praise you that we get to reflect on what it means to be saved and drawn near to your holiness. Help us now, we ask, in Jesus' name. Amen. I wonder what you feel about the idea of, of, of being a refugee. You know what a refugee is. It's somebody who has gone and taken refuge, run to somewhere and trusted in, in, in sometimes desperate hope that that place will give you safety, will give you a future, will give you security, will protect you from the threats that are out there. And so one of the many motifs and pictures of what it means to be, be a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is that we run to him and take refuge in him. Not a place, a person. And he invites us to do that. And he invites us to do that against the backdrop of our tendency to run to almost any other place that we can think of to try to make sense of who we are, to find a measure of hope, and to protect our small little bubbles that we call our lives. And so as we start this rather challenging and very direct, I tell you, Isaiah... Um, he was a, a very frank kind of guy. He doesn't sugarcoat anything. We're at a point in the book here where we're seeing that there is this wonderful promise of ref, ref, uh, refuge and salvation, and yet the people don't want to live out of it. There is a company of those whom the Lord has pursued, and he's saying, live under my salvation. And we saw the beauty of that last week. At the beginning of Isaiah 56, we said, let your new community be changed by its encounters with me so that you become like me, that you love justice and live right, that you welcome the outsider and that they have got a place, that all can come and feast with me. In fact, he says at the end of that section, verse 8, the sovereign Lord declares, he who gathers the exiles, that's what he loves to do, he gathers people, says come and be a part of my gang, come and live under me and know my mercy, I will gather still others to them beside those already gathered, but what kind of community will they get gathered into? And we find at the end of chapter 56 and the beginning of chapter 57, the Lord once again tells the people what he sees, and it's a mixed bag, okay? What you've got is a, a majority culture who he is calling to, but don't really want to hear. And in the midst of them, there are some who are seeking to live with him as their refuge. And they're called the righteous, not because they are right in and of themselves, but in this section of Isaiah, to be righteous means that you are somebody who is trying to take refuge in the Lord. You're, you're, you're trusting in his promises of righteousness. And so at the end of our section today, and I want you to hear this very loudly, he is calling out and saying, even to them, who we're going to see are pretty messy, even to them, this is what he's saying in verse 13, but whoever takes refuge in me will inherit the land and possess my holy mountain. So who are we to get today as a people? Well, listen, even in our church, there's a mixed bag. And the Lord's inviting you to decide Am I taking refuge in the Lord or am I living by all the practices and the perspectives of people all around? Am I somebody who runs to him personally? 
And rather than try and look for my answers to life and take my models for living from the nations around, am I running and hiding in him? And there's a promise that comes. And the promise is rather obscure. We'll inherit that, oh great, I get to move out of speak and get to go and live in the country. Is that what it means? No. And possess my holy mountain? No. What is the nature of that promise to those who take refuge in the Lord? You will inherit and be the recipients of all that it means to be in and near him. Yesterday in the, the conference, I, I read something that just blessed my heart. And it takes us straight into Jesus' language. But it's a, bit of a, it's a bit of a picture of inheriting the land and coming to the holy mountain. It's the, this is what it says by a guy called Rankin Wilborn. What a name. To be found in Christ means you don't have to prove yourself anymore. Your frantic attempts to find or craft an acceptable identity or your tireless work to manage your own reputation, these are over and done. You can rest in Christ. You don't have to be intimidated anymore, ever. Who are you? You are in Christ. And you no longer need to fear the judgment of God, for when God looks at you, he sees you hidden in Christ. Your inheritance is him. He is the land. This is freedom. This is confidence. This is good, good news. Can you say amen to that in your soul? Oh, I hope so. And so I don't know quite where you are at in your spiritual journey, but Isaiah 56 and 57 is saying that it is possible to have that on offer to you. But whilst you wait, the place where you go is somewhere else. And he's inviting us to take refuge. This is radical. You know, people, people think that the Christian life is really, you believe a few things and you try and do a few things right. Uh, right. Those things, that, that's not wrong. But the Christian life is a nurtured, cultivated walk with a God who says in every moment of every day, let it be shaped by you taking refuge and resting in me. Let me be your light. Does that sound like gospel Christianity? Of course because our problem isn't just that because of sin and rebellion against the God who made us and loved us, we need forgiveness. What we've also done is we've rebelled against relationship with him. We've said, I want you only when I want you. I don't want to live out of who you are. And so what he will be doing is working back into us a desire and the work of drawing us near to walk with and take refuge in him. And so what we're going to see is what happens when that doesn't happen. As we wait, we wander and we go in other places. And maybe you'll be glad to hear that the place where he starts is the leaders of the faith community. Let's have a look at 56, verse 13. <laughs> well, actually, he doesn't actually speak to them. He speaks to the beasts. Verse, th verse 9, sorry. Come, all you beasts of the field, come and devour all you beasts of the forest. In other words, he says... I can see what is going on and a point is coming where I'm going to come against it because it doesn't reflect me. It's not who I am. And it makes me angry what I see before my eyes. What is making him mobilize the beast of the field is a picture of judgment of the fact that he will only put up with it so long. Answer, Israel's watchmen are blind. He goes after lousy, useless leaders. Which immediately tells us something, that the God of the Bible says, we will be under somebody's influence. And you want to pick really carefully the ones whose influence you are under. And you don't want to be under the influence of these guys. They are lousy leaders. Why is that? Well, they're described as watchmen and shepherds. Those are two big pictures of the Bible of what leaders do. A watchman. So they stand in harm's way around the community and they keep an eye out for danger. Or they're shepherds. And what they do is they feed and they lead and they direct and they pay attention to the well-being of their sheep. But look what these ones do. Israel's watchmen are blind. Honestly, down at the Morrisons now, there'll be security guards who are there to keep an eye on what's going on and make sure the stock is looked after. What will be the one qualification to be a watchman and a guard up at the Morrisons right now? You can see... These guys are spiritually sick because they have no vision. In fact, it's backed up in the next phrase there. They, are, they all lack knowledge. 
Knowledge of what? Of who the Lord is. This echoes something of like the Pharisees in the day of Jesus who set themselves up as leaders of the people, but they were spiritually clueless. In fact, they were working against the very God who gave them the honored provision that they got there. So here are leaders who've got no care for who God is, and they're not bothered, really, about his people. But it gets worse. They are mute dogs. In other words, they've got, they've got no message. They're dogs who are supposed, this image there is that they are supposed to speak up and bark like a guard dog when there is danger coming. But they're not doing it. They're not telling the truth about who God is and what life is supposed to be like. They are mute dogs. They have no care for the truth. They're speaking, but they're speaking out of their own stupidity. They lie around and dream. They love sleep. They are dogs with mighty appetites. They never have enough. They are shepherds who lack understanding. They all turn to their own way. They seek their own gain. So they have no vision, they have no message, and they have no energy and zeal for God. Why? Because it's not that they've got no energy and zeal. What's their energy and zeal being given to? Have a look. What are, what are they giving themselves to? What's it say? Their own gain. Now, let's flip this around, because what we get here is a glorious and wonderful picture of the Lord Jesus and what anybody else who has any level of influence over others should be modeling themselves to be like. This is what God cares about, and I tell you what, his blood boils when he sees us doing the opposite, because they're almost in a study in contrast here. We get a sense that those who we will take influence from are those who see spiritual reality clearly and want to usher others in and call them and they have a message of hope and truth of refuge in the living God and they have energy but their energy isn't being given to building up their own platform creating a name for themselves or having a kind of life that is of their choosing no they will spend themselves for the building up the watching over and the shepherding of God's people which tells us that usually good leaders look quite tired. Because what they're doing is rather than taking the sheep and those they're supposed to be cared for and saying, I will use and fleece the sheep so that I get built up, what they do is they give themselves away for their sheep. Is that not a picture of the Lord Jesus? Is that not a picture of a beautiful humanity? And God here is angry that those who are in a trusted position are proving unfaithful. Come, each one cries, let me get wine, let us drink our fill of beer, and tomorrow we will, will be like today, or even far better. And in the book of Isaiah, there is so much feasting, there is speak of good drink, celebrating what is worth it, but these are using and leveraging that for their own ends. The reason why you drink is very, very important. They just want to sit out time they are a bunch of wasters now I hope in the bringing of this to you my sense is that because it's such strong language one of the things we could do is and I as a preacher can do this um, and I have to be very careful with it is just say them bad be good but what I think this is supposed to do for those who are righteous as we'll come to them in just a moment, is to say, primarily, not good, bad, yeah, it's a warning passage, but primarily to say, Lord, I want to thank you that you care about these things. And I want to thank you that you have provided for me a leader in the Lord Jesus, this servant who gets spoken of all the way through. I want, Lord, <laughs> to, to share something of your indignation and anticipation of you dealing with matters. And to the degree that I can, I want to choose very carefully those who influence me. But what's more, I think it's a little bit of a call to those of us who do have influence to say, do you know your God? Is, are his words on your lips in every conversation, whether in the home, in the workplace? And have you spent your energy not in getting gain and living, living at large on your terms, but by giving yourself away 
as Christ gave himself away for his people. Is this a position, is, is, this a, is this a picture of how we want society or how we want our church to be? If you sense a, a draw and a pull towards that, it's because you're on the same page as the Lord. Yes, Lord, I want to do my part in it and I want to, I, I, and I want to receive from it. But sadly, those who were righteous back in those days, they were a really small group. <laughs> And we see them and what happens to them in the next couple of verses. Look down at 57 verses 1 and 2. The righteous perish and no one takes it to heart. The devout are taken away and no one understands. That the righteous are taken away to be spared from evil. Those who walk uprightly enter into peace. And they find rest as they lie in death. This is bonkers. What he's saying is that in the midst of this horrible season where there is a refuge available but the leaders want to just do it their own way, there are occasions when some out of that small minority, that mixed bag, those who really are trusting in the Lord, do you see what it says there? He lifts them out of it. In other words, let me put it this way, I know that often we grieve when somebody dies before their time. It seems that one of the possibilities here, this is how big God is, one of the possibilities here is that if it is somebody who loves the Lord and dies before their time, it is because he is delivering them out of something more horrible that is coming down the line. C.S. Lewis describes this life here and now as the shadow lands, and don't we know and feel that from time to time? And God, in the economy of his great providence, holds all things in sway, and so we, he measures what his people need. And of course, to be with the Lord, absent from the body, present from the Lord, which is better by far. And look at the language there. And by the way, the application of this is, please, Lord, help me die tomorrow. That's not the application. But the application is to say we judge by a different standard. And so we stand for and live for him now while we can. But when he calls us home, the promise is real. Those who walk uprightly enter into his peace. They find rest as they lie in death. And I had a tear in my eye this week as I went to the funeral of a Christian sister. And the reason I had a tear in my eye was because of a life well lived. Story after story of her opening her home, sharing with young people the hope of Jesus, loving his scriptures taking something of the little bit of the world that was hers to influence and living for Jesus. And then in his time, she got called home. And what does that Bible verse say of her life? Those who walk uprightly enter into peace and they find rest as they lie in death. Is that your ambition? An awful lot of the way that I preach to you is talking about how Christ meets us in the here and now. But wouldn't it be bad if I as a pastor wasn't preparing your soul to think more thoughtfully about living for the then? And for those of us who are feel the weight of, uh, we're just odd bods because we want to take refuge in Jesus. Look at the personal care he has for us. I know some of you are, are waiting on and going to be having um, medical examinations and tests. And a day will come when that, that's me as well. Don't let that be your greatest fear. Because God has got you. He knows those who take refuge in him. And whether your days are long or whether your days are short, this promise stands. Those who walk uprightly, in other words, take re refuge in him, enter into peace. They find their rest as they lie in death. And later on in the chapter, and I'm so jealous, he gets to preach it next week, that most famous of verses, there is no rest for the... But there is rest. And so maybe some of you are still mourning the loss of, of loved, loved ones who knew the Lord. Can I tell you, if we could put a mic under their nose right now, they would say, don't worry about me, kid. Because all of his promises came true for me. 
and I'm resting in him. And I dare to suggest that maybe some of you are sitting here and go, Lord, I actually don't mind if my time comes soon. But with what I've got now, may every day be about shaping and enjoying finding refuge in you. Do you want to know what will get in the way of that? Idolatry. Which is what he goes after next. Look at this. And he's talking back to this majority who have this refuge open to them, but they don't want to take it. And I don't mind telling you this is incredibly vivid and brutal. In the first, the next few verses that we're going to read, he's talking about what they do, but then he starts to unpack what it costs them and why they do it. But you, come here, you children of sorcerer, sorceress, you offspring of adul- adulterers and prostitutes. So in other words, he's talking about those who are under the influence or come from a direct lineage of pagan religious practice, which is bad. It is marked by depravity and violence. It is cruel and it is oppressive, and yet people will volunteer themselves into it. And I remember going, Don't, they do this every day. This is horrific. The implications of cutting and marring their own souls and the violence and the devaluing of the humanity of others in their community and they've systematized it and they've institutionalized it. It is just normal so that nobody bats an eyelid. Oh, I thought as I looked upon that. And then I took a step back and I go, I wonder what the Lord would say about our culture and what we're encouraged to put our trust and faith in. Let me carry on and let let me be quite vivid. Who are you mocking? At whom do you sneer and stick out your tongue? Are you not a brood of rebels, the offspring of liars? In other words, there's a certain defiance about it. Yeah, we're going to do this because we can. Because this is the way to find life. You burn with lust among the oaks and under every spreading tree. Yes, that's right. There were orgies and sexual practices associated with the uh, cults. And they would gather in certain parts of the country. And it was described as being under the oaks or in and near the ravines. You sacrifice your children in the ravines and under the overhanging crags. What is wrong with these people? And then we remember that in the UK, the average over the last 10 years has been 200 children sacrificed in the womb. And we've got people who stand up in public and say abortion's a great idea. You see, back in, uh, back in that culture, children were cheap and were to be sacrificed at the cost of a promise of blessing in your life, whether that is autonomy, the freedom to choose. I want my life to be about what I want it to be. Perhaps sometimes we sacrifice the well-being and caring of our kids, not with blood, but with abandonment, because we're so busy pursuing our self-interest or our ambitions to overwork. And the Lord sees it and he calls it for what he, what it is. It's not his way. Those who have got responsibility are supposed to give themselves away, not give those who they're supposed to care for over to a fire. We find that the name of Moloch is mentioned here. The practice was incredibly cruel. It was literally take a small child, heat up the equivalent of a body warmer made of brass in the fire and wrap it around them so they boiled alive. And then they would sing and they would dance about it. And we would look on and go, this is horrific. How can you think this is good? But it was so written into them, this dependency to... To, to find something to promise us blessing for the future. Verse 6, the idols among the smooth stones of the ravines are your portion. Indeed, they are your lot. Yes, to them you have poured out drink offerings and offerings, grain, uh, and offered grain offerings in view, uh, sorry, in view of all this, should I relent. In other words, I'm watching what you're doing and you think I'm not and I ultimately will do something about this. And it moves into a section that starts talking about the the cost of idolatry. The trusting of something else to bring you a better future. It always demands that you pay. Look at some of the things they're having to pay. Behind, uh, Behind your doors and your doorpost, you have put up your pagan symbols. So you have to strongly ally yourself with it. Forsaking me, you covered your bed. You climbed into it and opened it wide. In other words... um, 
The sexual connotations are there, but it was the degrading of themselves and doing it publicly. You made a pact with those whose beds you love, and you looked with lust on their naked bodies. You went to Moloch, there's the guy I mentioned, with olive oil and increased your, your perfumes. You sent your ambassadors far away. You descended to the very realm of the dead. They were doing deals probably with Egypt to try to find this. And each, the Egyptian practices, for anybody who's watched any of the historical films will tell you, they're pretty graphic and horrific. And in the process of doing that, it exacted a cost upon them. You wearied yourself by such going about, but you would not say, it is hopeless. So when they gave themselves to practices to give them a sense of meaning and bring blessing into their life and to be in control of their situation, which is what idolatry is, you find your amulet, your thing, and you pay something, you give something of yourself away to it, and after a while they were wearied and worn out, and that would have been a great wake-up moment, wouldn't it? Maybe this isn't what I'm supposed to be living for. Maybe I should go back and think about who God is. Maybe there are better answers to the questions of, of life and what it's all about. But instead, when they were weary and they were broken down, they doubled down. They piled back in. They didn't slow down. They kept pushing on. But you would not say, it is hopeless. You, renew you found renewal of your strength, and so you did not faint. I'm going to give it another go. And so, well, what do I want to say? This tells us something about the nature of a corruption in the human heart. Yes, we can do violence and perverse things, but what is going on here? Both in, with the leaders in chapter 56 and in these, the general populace, apart from the, those who are uh, in that small little remnant of the righteous, we find that there is a longing. Has that ever caused you to question, where does this longing for something to trust and believe in, where does it come from? Now you think about what has pressured you in this last week and that your sense of being able to find a refuge in something and you will have your own set of answers and every now and again the Lord will lead you to a point where you are wearied by that and you are caused to question but what your temptation will be to double down and rush back to it and say well it's not work because I didn't try hard enough. And maybe it isn't as outwardly gross as these things but still that same sense of longing within us we will try to meet. We will try to fill ourselves. We're looking for it. So the question in the Bible is never ultimately, what am I doing outwardly? It's asking, where are my affections? What do I live for? Where do I take refuge? What do I trust there? So when you become a Christian, everything's on the table. You decide to start saying, Lord, would you search my heart and help me to see the different ways in which I'm prone to giving myself away in defiance of you to try and find what I can only find in you. So we see here in all these examples there is this sense of longing that we're supposed to respond to, but it's also about allegiance, what you worship. Notice how it talks about pursuing and making your bed with and identifying with and going with the patterns of. That's allegiance, it's pursuit. I suppose we could put it this way. You grant rulership of your heart and life to something. You give it away. You give yourself away and, and, and ally yourself with something. And it's an act of trust. And so the Lord is coming along and saying, you've trusted and backed the wrong horse. Because this horse will kill you. I will set you free. And so what we do whenever we're in a moment where something of what, a pressure point, maybe it's a conflict situation, maybe it's a moment where we get in a look at ourselves and we don't really like our responses. Maybe it's what we give our time and where we spend our money on. What it's, maybe it's categorized by uh, when we say, oh, my life will be a success if. We slow down and we say, in, which way, in what way have I given my allegiance over to that? Am I trusting it to make me okay, to bring blessing into my life, to make me fu feel fulfilled? And so we find out where this is all going to head and all this is going to lead. Whom have you so dreaded and feared that you have not been true to me? Do you, you see that? We fear things, then we run for a solution. 
And the only thing that can overcome our fear is a greater fear. False fears will bind us and hold us. But he says, fear me. Know and trust me. And have neither remembered me nor taken this to heart. Is it not because I have long been silent that you do not fear me? In other words, he's saying, let me tell you how I deal with you and work with you. And this is so true today for us. When we are pursuing our own answers and our own solutions, the Lord sometimes, I mean, okay, let's do a parenting class. Some of you in your parenting, when you see your child move towards a naked flame, you jump straight up. And before they've barely moved, you drag them back. Some of us, when you see your child walk in the direction of a naked flame, what do you do? You let them walk up and learn it for themselves. Now, I'm not going to argue which one is better or worse or when the right time to do one or the other is. But we're told here in the Bible that sometimes, in kindness and in grace, the Lord lets us destroy ourselves. Let's us pursue our good ideas. And in his kindness, it is giving moments for us to realize that our strategies will not always work for us. Now, in this room, there are loads of us who've got testimonies of that. I thought this would deliver life. I pursued hard after it. And then it bit. And that kindness, that slowness of God is supposed to lead us, Romans chapter 2, to repentance. But as he... But for them, it did the opposite. That's not a problem with him. It's a problem with them because, well, what did it do? Uh, (laughs) Oh, where's the bit? I've just lost it. Let me read all the way through and I'll stop when I get through. "Whom, Whom have you so dreaded and feared that you have not been true to me and neither remembered me nor taken this to heart? Is it, aha, is it not because I have long been silent that you do not fear me? Now that should sort of strike a measure of fear into our heart. It, some of us could be in a season where the Lord is letting us pursue and chase after stuff rather than taking refuge in him. Our solutions. And he's just quietly saying, no, nah, this is going to fall apart. This might break you a bit. If it is, and you feel a tinge of that, then speak to him and say, Lord, would you pull me up quickly? Would you help me to find refuge in you? Because I don't want it to go too bad. And I certainly don't want to have a hard heart towards you. I don't want to be somebody who, in your kindness and patience, rather than repenting, doubles down on this. Verse 12, I will expose your righteousness and your works. It's sarcasm here. He's like, all the things that you think are really good and cool about you, that you think will work, a day is coming when it's going to be brought out into the light. And they will not benefit you. When you cry out for help, let your collection of idols save you. The wind will carry all of them off. A mere breath will blow them away. He is giving them over to what they have set their hearts upon. And then, having said all of that, but, but, and this is such a big but, I'm here. And I'm so ready. And it doesn't take much. I've so... I so want you to come back and take refuge in me. And you will inherit the land and possess my holy mountain. So as we wrap up this text, we have to ask ourselves what we're supposed to do with it. Maybe you see yourself in that category of people who are seeking to find refuge in him, but not very good at it. And can I tell you, he is for you. And he knows your plight And he, by his spirit, is going to help you to walk in his way. Perhaps you find yourself as somebody who's beginning to recognize that I'm flirting with other sources of confidence and idolatry. And I'm taking my station in life and my influence and using them all for myself. And even in sitting under this word, you're prepared to say, Lord, would you turn me around before I end up in a worse place? Or for some of us, it's just going to make us long for that day. It's going to make us long for that day where we are more present with that promise. Anyone who takes refuge in me will inherit the land and possess my holy, my holy mountain. Do you want that? Do you want to be as 
pulled into and taken up by and made new by all of this promise of a righteous and holy God who could kick us to the floor, but instead said, I've made a place for you through my son, my servant, the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants to stir our hearts that this is open. So even in a minute as we sing, and you were singing so well earlier, be asking him to do that. Lord, be the only refuge. Oh, don't let me, please, don't let me be like everybody else around. In a mixed bag, help me to be near to you. Bring me in. I want you to be my refuge. Let's stand and sing together.